Amen. So you're going to keep your place in Hebrews chapter number 11. We're going to leave there and then we're going to come back. That's going to be our main chapter. So when you leave Hebrews chapter 11, um, just make sure that you keep a bookmark or a finger in that chapter. All right, Hebrews chapter 11, known, known as the faith chapter. So I think you kind of have an idea of what we're going to talk about this morning. In Galatians 5.22, I'm just going to read it for you. This can be our last sermon on the fruits of the Spirit. And it's maybe one of the most important ones, if you could say that um, there's one that is greater than the others. I would think that this one probably ranks towards the top, so I, le I left the best for last. I think that this is probably something that is, it's a main theme in the Bible. We're going to go all over the Bible this morning, and I'm not even touching a little bit on the topic um, that the Bible talks about this morning. But we're going to look at, in verse number 22 of Galatians 5, I'll read for you. It says, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. At the end of that chapter, or the end of that verse, we're going to look at faith this morning, the fruit of the Spirit, which is faith. Go back to Hebrews chapter number 11, if you would. Hebrews chapter number 11. I think that faith should be talked about more. Many times that we think about faith is saving faith. When we go out soul winning, we talk about how, you know, we're saved by grace through faith. It is, you know, faith trusting in Jesus. But what is faith? Faith has so much more to do than just salvation, all right? So faith plays a role in your life or should play a role in your life as a saved believer. And I think that maybe we need to study this a little bit more and look at this more in our Christian lives, but faith is beyond the faith of just salvation, all right? So faith, and obviously you cannot be saved without faith, which is trusting in the Lord, all right? But faith should go much more beyond just the fact that you are trusting on the fact that God sent his son to die um, for your sins, all right? That's what it takes for salvation, but faith in the Christian life is ultra important. And that's what I want to get across to you this morning. Look at Hebrews chapter number 11 and look at verse number one. We're not going to go through this whole chapter, but I want to show you what is faith. All right. What is faith? These are obviously, um, you know, people that we're going to be looking at here. These are saved people in Hebrews chapter number 11. It's called the faith chapter for a reason. If you look at how many times in Hebrews chapter 11, it says by faith or through faith, it's like well over a dozen times that this, this phrase is just repeated and repeated and repeated, showing the importance of faith in the life of a Christian, all right? Not just at that moment of salvation or that faith that it takes to be saved. Look at the verse, uh, verse number one, for the definition of faith, all right? So it makes sense that the chapter that's on faith would define it first. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So this is saying, and it gives all these you know, people that we're going to talk about here in just a minute, I'm not going to go through every single one of them, but basically faith, what it comes down to is faith for the unbeliever and the believer is believing what God said, believing God. That's what faith comes down to. Look at verse number two. It says, for by it, the elders obtained a good report, saying that there were people in the past that had faith. They had a good report when it came to this idea of faith, all right? Through faith, we understand. Now, verse number three, verse number three is a complicated verse, but it's a super important verse because God gets into some individuals in the coming verses, but here he gives like this overall example of faith in verse number three. But the point is, faith is believing God, all right? Faith is believing God. And, and again, that's why, you know, if you're literally, you cannot be saved if you don't have faith. That's why out soul winning many times, you know, I will ask people when I'm out soul winning, it's like, well, do you believe that the Bible is the word of God? And if a person does not believe that the Bible is God's word, there's 0% chance that they will get saved. Look, I'm not saying that, you know, you go out soul winning and somebody says that, oh, no, I think man wrote that or whatever. If that person is still willing to listen, I'll still preach the gospel to that person because they can at least hear what the Bible says. Because the, the sad fact is the vast majority of people in this country at this point have no idea what's in this book. They have no idea what it says. They've never heard the gospel. And here's the thing. Even if somebody doesn't believe at that moment that the word of, you know, that the Bible is the word of God, 
when they hear the gospel and how logical and how much, how much sense that it makes, maybe that, maybe they won't get saved in that moment, but maybe it'll make them rethink some things in their life. So I'm not saying I won't preach the gospel to somebody, but until someone decides that this is God's word, they have no chance of being saved. It's that simple because it takes faith to trust in Jesus, who is, by the way, the word of God, all right, in itself. But look at verse number three. Now let's get some examples here of faith, all right? Through faith, we understand. So it's saying we can understand things through faith that the worlds were framed by the word of God. What does that mean? What does that mean? We understand through faith that the worlds were framed by the word of God. What are, what are the worlds? The worlds is, it's the universe. It's, it's earth and all the planets and the stars and, and everything, right? It were framed, meaning put together. You know, when you frame a building, what are you doing? You're building it. You're creating it, all right? They were framed by the word of God. So that makes sense according to the Bible, does it not? Because how did God create the universe? He literally spoke it into existence. So literally the universe was Jesus Christ, the Bible says, is the creator. He is the word of God. That's what God used to create the universe. So it says but through faith we understand that though. Why? Because that's what the Bible tells us in Genesis. And God said, and God said, and God said, and God said. That's what the Bible says. So we have faith. We, we believe what God says in Genesis on how it all came to be. It says, so that the things, look at the rest of this, this is just a brilliant verse here, so that the things which are seen were not made of the things which do appear. You're like, what does that mean? That means we through faith know that God, through Jesus Christ, the word of God, created everything. Like, that's the mechanics of it. That's how it happened is what the Bible is literally telling us. And through faith, I believe that, all right? Through faith, I believe that. I don't believe what it's saying in the second part of this verse. I don't believe that the things which are seen are how things were made, basically, right? So what do, what do I mean? I don't believe the universe created itself. That's what it's saying. Like, oh, the, the Bible, is there any, I mean, what in the world? It's like, how could the Bible have known that this is what people would believe? I mean, that's a, that verse is a literal miracle in itself. 2,000 years ago, think about this. 2,000 years ago, that verse was penned. L literally saying that through faith, we know that God created the universe through his word. So people, so we don't think that the universe, you know, that things which are seen are not made of things which do appear. That's that saying like the things that are there do not create the things that are there. And how would Paul, a man, have known that that's exactly what people would start teaching? Nature didn't create itself, is what the Bible is saying. You say, well, what did? I mean, the creation, first of all, let me just not, this isn't the point of the sermon, but the creation of the Bible, first of all, it makes sense. It makes sense, and there is no real science, when I say real science, that can disprove it. Because everything that God has done is proven through the very laws that God created. The problem is, like, science has become just fake and made up. I mean, did you know that in the 1800s, in the early 1800s, it was mainstream belief that the earth was a few thousand years old? There was one wacko that thought it was like 75,000 years old in the 1800s. Well, you say... What, so here's a problem that a lot of people that are saying like, well, you know, you can fit, you can fit, you know, creation into mainstream science today. It's like, where did this billions of years and all this kind of stuff come from? It came from one simple theory. It came from the theory of evolution in 1849. That's where the billions of years came from. You never even heard of it. Until, and even after 1849, it wasn't billions of years, it was like, 20 or 40 million. And then it just kept going up and up and up and up and up. Because honestly, when you start thinking about evolution and what needs to take place and what we can visibly observe and test, like they're just like, well, it's not possible mathematically. So what, it's still not possible mathematically, by the way, even with billions of years. It's been literally mathematically disproven. I mean, I don't even know what to say. 
But my point is, the billions of years came from the premise of evolution. So if you're sitting there saying, well, you know, no, it was the billions of years and, you know, it, it, things look like they're billions of years old. No, no, no. The science was built. It was built specifically to fit this square peg into this round hole. So basically, it's not science if you start doing a bunch of tests and start developing a bunch of theories with a preconceived conclusion already. That's not science, folks. And that's exactly what's happened with this theory of evolution. They just had to fit everything in to this idea that, you know, the whole thing just exploded and here we are. All right, and that's why the Earth is four point. And they just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and it's just going to keep getting more and older and older and older. I mean, imagine missing it by, you know, a factor of a hundred or three hundred or whatever. I mean, even the twenty million turned into two hundred million, turned into a billion, turned into what is it, four point five for the Earth and like thirteen for the the universe or whatever. But people are just like, oh, that's that's it's so long they can't even fathom it in their head. They're like, yeah, it must be true, or evolution must be true. It's just, it's, it's bizarre, to be honest with you. It's a religion in itself, all right? But the point is, the creation actually makes logical sense. And you can disprove all these things that are saying, that pointing to evolution, pointing to this singularity. I mean, to believe that, like, all the mass of the universe was smashed into a microscopic dot, I mean, right there, like, you should exit the building at that point. Just be like, yeah, what? But anyway, back to the, the Bible here. Look at verse number six. So the Bible is saying that just, you know, even though it is logical, even though it is, you know, it can't be disproved by science or anything like that, real science, the Bible is saying that literally, like, just take, I mean, it takes faith to believe that everything was smashed into a microscopic dot. That takes a lot of faith. I actually think it takes less faith to just believe the Bible, much less. All right, because the Bible has just been proven again and again and again to be true. But look at verse number six. So it's saying just the creation itself, just the creation of itself is, is you know, based on faith. All right, look at verse number six. Now, here's an important point, but without faith, again, this idea that we can believe God, we can believe what's written down in the Bible, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. I think that's a pretty important point for Christians today. I mean, as a saved believer who wants to be a disciple, wants to walk in a pleasing relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ throughout their physical life on this earth, I think, you know, pleasing God would be an important thing for us to want to do. But it's saying without faith, it's like faith is the prerequisite. Like you can't even get into that point where you could possibly please God if you don't have faith. It's saying it's impossible without it. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So if you even want to have blessings in your life, you need to believe that God can bless you. You need to have faith. So look, there can be no salvation without faith. We get that. But that's not going to be what this sermon is about since you're all saved, hopefully, this morning. But the question is, you know, tonight or this morning... Um, God now gives us some examples of people in Hebrews chapter number 11. And this is super important, and this is something that I'm going to go into great detail on tonight. All right, so God's telling us faith is important. It literally shows you how God created the world. You need to have faith in that. You need to have faith in the Word of God. That's how you get saved, through faith. But then God goes, and he gives us some saved people that had faith. Why? Because God is giving you an example of somebody that did it. And this is a huge miss today. And I don't know how people could miss this. And I'm going to go into great detail on this tonight. But the examples are super important in your Christian life. Why would God give so many examples here of faith? Because he's saying, look, I'm telling you to do this. And here's some people that did. And here's how it turned out. That's what he's saying. And here's how pleased I am with them, all right? Look at verse number seven. It says, by faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not, not seen as yet. God told Noah the, the earth is going to be destroyed. And Noah didn't see that coming. God just told him. And I mean, would he have started building an ark if he just didn't believe God? No, here's a saved man. God told him something specific and he believed it 
and he built this ark that God wanted him to build. Moved with fear, prepared an ark. Would he be afraid of anything if he didn't believe God? God is showing that these people just believed. They didn't have anything to see. They didn't have any evidence. They just believed what God said. It was that simple. Abraham, when he was called out to go into a place which should not after receive, which he should after receive for inheritance, Abraham didn't inherit the land. He went there. He wasn't welcome there. He was a stranger there. He just obeyed. He went out not knowing whither he went. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. He did not get the land in his lifetime. Hundreds of years would pass before the children of Israel, which were Abraham's descendants, would enter into the promised land. He just had faith that what God said was true. Look at verse 32. Now he goes, through, he goes through multiple other examples that I'm not going to go through, but the point is they just believed what God said. Verse 32, and what, more, what shall I more say? This is how many other examples in the Bible of faith that you know, we could give. I mean, the chapter could be you know, dozens of pages long with examples. For the time would fail to tell of Gideon, of Barak, of Samson, of Jephthah, of David also, Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, and stop the mouth of lions. Through faith, they were able to do all these wonderful things for what? For the kingdom of heaven. If they wouldn't have had the faith, none of these things would happen. It's interesting, though, that I want to point out Daniel's faith right there. It says, stop the mouths of lions. That doesn't that, and that's, that's the first point I want to make tonight, or this morning, I'm sorry. Your faith, the first point is, and I want to use Daniel's example right there, the first point is your faith or your lack of faith affects how God intervenes in your life. If you lack faith, God will not intervene. You know, that implies right there that it was Daniel's faith that saved him from the lion's den. It was his faith that God could save him, that, that, stopped, that literally stopped the mouths of the lions. It was, I mean, in, in that sense, if Daniel would have not believed that God could do that for him, Look, and it's not all about, it's like, it reminds me of uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know, God can save us. We don't know if he will, but we believe that he can. That's faith. Not putting, you know, the answer into God's, you know, not taking the answer, you know, and just giving the answer for God. Like, no, I know God can do this. That's faith. And if Daniel didn't have the faith that God could do that, it wouldn't have happened. So the first point is this. Whether you have faith or not, that will determine whether or not God intervenes for you in your life. I think that's pretty important. I mean, you're saved, but let me tell you something. You're going to need God to intervene for you in your life. Turn to Matthew or Mark chapter number 5. Turn to Mark chapter number 5. And again, I can't give all the examples here. There's too many in the Bible. But the Bible teaches directly that your faith and the strength of your faith is directly proportional to the great, God, the great works that God will do in your life. And I'll give you a personal example of this as well, because this is something that after I got saved, like, I didn't know much about until I started practicing this. And this is something that no Christian should miss. Look at Mark chapter 5, verse number 24. If you lack faith, you're not going to see God intervening in your life. If you have faith, God will intervene for you. God is not, you know, just this watchmaker or whatever, like, you know, the enlightenment teaching that he just sets this thing and just lets it go. God intervenes all the time and he will intervene for you, but it is directly proportional to the faith that you have in him. All right. So that's what I want to show you this morning. Look at Mark 5 and verse number 24. It says, Jesus went with him and much people followed him and thronged him. And a certain woman, which had an issue of blood 12 years, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and spent all that she had, and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse. When she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind, so there's this massive crowd around Jesus, and touched his garment. You say, well, Jesus is just magical, and he's like a superhero, where anybody that touches him is just instantly healed, or whatever. It's like, no, that's not the case. Look at verse number 28. For she said, 
if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. You know what that is? That right there is her faith. That right there is her believing that Jesus Christ can heal her. And I'm sure that, you know, there was belief that he was the son of God that came along with that. But the point is, she was made whole. Look down at verse, look, and straightway, verse 29, the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of the plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and he said, who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou, who touched me? The, the disciples were like, everybody's touching you. What are you even talking about? But Jesus could tell that healing left him. He could tell. So Jesus did not even consciously think at that point that I'm going to heal this woman. It was his power as God combined with what? Let's keep reading. Verse 7. Wherefore, neither thought I myself worthy. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Jesus went with them. And when he was not far from the house, uh, I'm sorry, I'm reading the wrong thing. Um, where did I leave off? 32, 33. But the woman fearing and trembling, knowing that it, what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. She said, it was me. Verse 34. And he said unto her, daughter, thy faith had made thee whole. So it was the power of God in Jesus Christ plus what? Plus her faith. Those two things are what healed this woman. If she didn't have faith, you think she would have been healed? No, if she didn't have faith, she'd have been just like any of these, the other people that were, that were touching Jesus, that were around Jesus. It was her faith plus the fact that he was God that healed her. Turn to Luke chapter 7. Turn to Luke chapter number 7. Turn to Luke chapter number 7. Every single time that Jesus healed somebody, there was faith involved too. That's what you need to see. I'll give you one more example and then we'll move on. But the point is, God intervening in your life is directly proportional to your faith in him, in that he can do that thing, that he is able to help you with that thing. I mean, don't pray without faith. Just save, save your time. If you have no faith that God, I mean, every single example of what the things that we're going to pray for is not in the Bible. But there may be things going on in your life that you need help with. Don't pray to God not thinking he can help you. Just save your breath because it must be combined with faith. Look at verse uh, number one of Luke 7. Now, when he ended all these sayings in an audience of the people, he entered into Capernaum. And a certain centurion servant who was dear unto him was sick and ready to die. When he heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying that he was worthy for whom he should do this. So here's, a, here's an interesting character, all right? He's a, he's a centurion. He's a Roman. But the Jews like him. You know, the Jews like him. They think, you know, he's a, he's a just man, apparently. He's, he's, a, he's a good ruler. He's a man of power. He's a centurion. Um, he's got servants underneath him. And he has people advocating here, even the Jews whom the, the, the Romans are ruling over at this time. So he's obviously not an impressive person, not somebody that has a bad report amongst um, those are without, that are without, right? Look at verse number five. For he loveth our nation, and he hath built us a synagogue. He's done things for um, the nation. Then Jesus went with them. And when he was now not far from the house, the centurion sent friends unto him, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that thou should enter under my roof. So Jesus is literally going to this guy's house and this guy sends people out to intercept Jesus, and he says, you know, don't come here because, like, you're, I, you're, you're, I don't deserve to have you in my house. All right? A very, a very humble man. So he's, a very, he's got a lot of humility here. And look at verse number 7. He says, wherefore, neither thought on myself worthy to come unto thee. He's like, I don't feel like... He's, he was actually surprised that Jesus was coming to him, and he's, he didn't feel worthy that he should be able to even go to Jesus, all right? Uh, extreme humility here. But then look at this. Here's the faith right here after the, the, the end of verse number seven. He says, but say in a word and my servant shall be healed. Now, a lot of people could read that just be like, you know, he just wants him to just speak it so he doesn't have to go through this effort of coming. No, he didn't feel worthy that Jesus should come there. And he didn't even feel worthy that he should stand in front of Jesus. But he has such faith 
in who Jesus is and the power that he has, he said, just speak it and it will be done. You say, how could he have that kind of faith? Because look at verse number eight. He says, for I also am a man set under authority, having under me soldiers. And I say unto one, go, and he goeth, and to another, come, and he cometh, and to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. So he literally says, I know how authority works. When I t He's like, I have this little authority, and I have these soldiers underneath me, and I just tell them what to do, and they just do it. But he's saying, you have authority over everything. <laughs> I mean, who other than God would have authority to speak a word and heal someone that's not even there? So he's literally acknowledging that Jesus is God. He's acknowledging that Jesus has this power. He's acknowledging the faith that he has in Jesus Christ. When Jesus heard these things, so Jesus knew what he was saying. He marveled at him and turned about and said unto the people that followed him. He says to his own disciples, I say unto you, I've not found so great faith. No, not in Israel. He's saying, this man has a lot of faith. And there they were sent, returning to his house, and found the servant whole that had been sick. And it, it happened just like that. Because of why? Because Jesus was God, and he had faith in what Jesus could do. The woman believed all she had to do was touch Jesus. This man believed all he had to do was say it, and it would be done. And that is great faith. The point, our faith is directly proportional to God's response to us. So of the fruits of the Spirit that you want to have, faith should be on top of your list. Look, but the opposite is also true. Turn to Matthew chapter number 13. Turn to Matthew chapter number 13. Matthew 13, look at verse number 54. Matthew 13, look at verse number 54. The Bible says, And when he was come into his own country... He taught them in their synagogue, and so much that they were astonished and said, Once hast this man this wisdom and these mighty works. Is it not the carpenter's son? Is this not his mother called Mary and his brethren James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? Like, but Mary only had Jesus. I mean, I don't know what you do with that one. And his sisters, are they not all with us? Whence then has this math? man all these things so basically it's saying here that all these people knew jesus from when he was a boy and it that made it harder for them to believe that he was the son of god all right that's what it's pointing out here but the point is that i'm going to make is that you know that's many times by the way if you've given the gospel to people that you know and you're very close to maybe you got saved later in life and you've given the gospel over and over and over to somebody and they're not receptive many times you should just bring them to church and somebody else can give the gospel to them and they'll get saved i can't tell you how many times I've seen that because many times they just need to see it from somebody other than you. I'm not trying to offend you, but sometimes, you know, if you just given the gospel to somebody that you're close to so many times, they're like, but yeah, isn't this, but isn't this Jared? Like we knew this guy like when he was 12 and he was a nightmare, you know, or whatever. Right. So bring people to other people. And many times you will find that they will be more receptive because the prophet, again, is not without honor, save in his own country and his own house. All right? So that's a real thing. Look at verse 58. So these people didn't believe him. They didn't have what? They didn't have faith. And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. So not only are these people not going to get saved, but he's not going to do these miracles there because they lacked the faith that he could do the miracles. They're just like, yeah, this is just Joseph's son. This is just the carpenter that lives on 3rd Street. He had that kid. Yeah, well, yeah, he was a nice kid. Son of God? I, yeah, what? That was these people. And they lacked the faith, so he didn't do the works there. Right, so it's believing. It goes beyond salvation. That's what you need to see in your Christian life. Matthew 7. Matthew 7. Actually, I'll read for you Matthew uh, number 7, you, or chapter number 7. You turn to Matthew chapter number 17. Turn to Matthew chapter number 17. Look, it is believing not just what the Bible says. It is believing, though, that God can do what he says he will do, that's the Bible, but then also what you ask him to do. In Matthew 7, the Bible literally says, ask and it shall be given unto you. I mean, seek and you shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh, receive it. But don't ask if you just think, like, this is not possible. Why ask? Don't ask in that case, because the faith 
must be there. Look at Matthew 17, verse number 20. Matthew 17, verse number 20. And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if ye have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. So here they're talking about, you know, they're talking about why they couldn't cast out a demon, why they couldn't do some great work. And you say, you lack the faith. That's why. So if you're asking for something that you have no faith that God can do for you, uh, save the time. That's what the Bible is teaching, right? So God, the first point is this, the first importance of faith that I'm trying to sell this to you this morning. The first importance is that your faith or the faith is a spectrum. Faith is a spectrum. James chapter two, that's the dead faith. All right. Faith without works is dead. All right. That's the faith. That's the person that has enough faith to be saved, but they don't have faith in anything else God can do for them. They're just kind of like the bare minimum Christian. But then you have these people, God, Jesus is saying in Matthew 17, 20, he's like, or you could have great faith and you could literally do anything. You could literally have God intervene for you at every single point in your life. So God, the faith that you have is directly proportional to the response God will have to you. All right, turn to 1 Kings chapter number four. That's the first point. That's the first point. And without that faith, it's impossible to please God. The, first, the second point is this. Your faith must come first. You say, I want God to intervene for me. I want God to intervene in my life. Your faith, your belief in God, and every single one of those examples that Hebrews chapter 11 gave, the faith came first. The faith came before the promise. Look at verse uh, number 5 of 1 Kings chapter number 4. Verse number five. First Kings chapter number four. Look at verse number five. See, stupid things Christians do is they think, well, God's not, they don't have any faith. They don't have any faith. And they're like, yeah, God can't do this for me. God can't fix this for me. So they get outside of the will of God and they try to fix things. They take things into their own hands. They try to fix things themselves. They get outside the will of God and everything just turns into a complete disaster for them. Not knowing that the faith needs to come first before God will step in. Look at 1 Kings 4, verse number 5. In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God said, Ask, what shall I give thee? He's literally telling him to ask. And Solomon said, Thou hast showed unto thy servant David, my father, great mercy, according as he had walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with thee. And thou hast kept for him this great kindness, and thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant, thy servant king instead of David my father. And I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or how to come in. So first of all, he's very humble. Just as we saw the centurion, he's very humble coming to God. And thy servant, verse 8, is in the midst of thy people, which thou hast chosen a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. So he's humble. He's just telling God how great these people are. And by the way, this explains why it was wrong for David to do a census. It was wrong for David to do a census because that was the opposite of what Solomon is saying here. So Solomon is basically saying, you've just got these people, they're great in multitude and they're just great uh, people. And he's, he's doing that in the sense like, how am I going to rule these people? But David counting a census are like, are, is like checking on God. Like, are, are, are we really great? Are we really powerful? It was a what? It was a lack of faith to do the census. And that's why God was so upset with it. Look at verse number nine. Verse number nine. Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this so great a people? He asked for something that would literally benefit the nation and not himself. And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. Essentially, Solomon did the right thing. He was humble first. He looked at the job in front of him and said, who am I to do this job? And he asked for something. Look, he had faith first. And then God said, well, you're just going to have everything. I'm going to give you the understanding heart, and I'm going to give you all the possessions, and I'm going to give you all the things that you'd ever want to. You'll have great riches, great wisdom. God gave him everything. But Solomon first had the faith. 
that God could do so. Turn to 1 Peter chapter number 5. 1 Peter chapter number 5. 1 Peter chapter number 5, look at verse number 6. The point I'm trying to make here is that you have to have the faith first for God to be able to intervene in your life. That if you have the faith, God will intervene, but you must have the faith first. It's like, okay, God, if you do this, then I'll believe you. No, that's not how God works at all. You're never going to see God intervene if you're asking God, like you're testing the Lord. You're test well, show me a sign, God. How did, how did Jesus handle that? Look at 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse number 6. It's like, no, it's wicked people that want a sign. It's people that have no faith that need a sign. Show me something, God. Like, you know, make the sky open or something and, you know, make it rain in the next minute and then I'll believe you, God. This is, this is asking for a sign. Look at 1 Peter 5 verse number 6. Humble, yourself, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Notice that. Notice that it's saying, humble yourselves before God, put yourselves down low, knowing that God is who he is and he can do anything, and then he'll exalt you in due time. What does that mean? It means that it won't be right now. That you might have to wait a little while. But the point is that you need to humbly ask in faith, and then be patient, waiting on the Lord. God responds to humility and faith. Turn to Proverbs chapter number 28. And Solomon, he, in the last example we looked at, he proved himself faithful. We see what? We see another example. All right, Proverbs 28, look at verse number 20. Proverbs 28, verse number 20. So the two points that I pointed out so far is that God intervening in your life will be directly proportional to the amount of faith that you have, all right? The amount of belief that you have in that he can do what he, you're asking him to do, that his word, the promises in his word are true. And then the second point is, is that that faith that you have must come before God intervenes. Look at Proverbs 28 and verse number 20. And look, that faith may need to be there for a while. As a matter of fact, in Hebrews chapter number 11, their faith just existed for their whole life. Those are extreme examples of faith because they didn't even see the stuff in their lifetime. They just believed, you know, they just believed that it was going to happen. And, you know, they're looking up from heaven down at what did happen. And that was filled, but not in their lifetimes in many of those cases. Proverbs 28, 20 says, a faithful man shall abound with blessings. But he that maketh haste to be rich shall not be innocent. Here's an example of somebody who's, you know, just like, there's a faithful guy who's just like, you know what, I'm just going to do what I'm supposed to do. I'm just going to go out. I'm going to work hard. I'm going to find some just gain that God wants me to have. And I'm just going to be smart. And I'm going to follow the word of God as far as how I operate in my life. And I'll abound with blessings. You know, those blessings may take years or decades or whatever, or maybe I don't even see them, whatever. But he that maketh hate to be rich is somebody that gets outside of God's will and just like heads to the casino or whatever. Just wants to go. And this is why people that make haste to get, get rich are just easy to rip off. Because they don't want to do it the way God says. They don't want to have that patience. They don't want to wait on God. You don't think there's Christians that, you know, make haste to, to be rich? You don't think that this is a problem that pertains to Christians? No, it's a lack of faith is what it is. It's a lack of faith that God can do what he says he can do, that he can bless you. So the faith must come first. So if I have faith, what are the results? Turn to 1 Peter chapter number 1. Let's look at the results. That's the third point I'm going to close on this morning, is the results of faith. What will you see if you have faith, if you believe God, if you pray to God believing that he can do what he says, or what you're asking him to do, what can I expect from that? Look at 1 Peter 1. Look at verse number 7. The Bible, the Bible says that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold, than perisheth, though it be tried with fire, may be found unto praise and honor and to glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. So the first thing that the Bible is saying here is that you're going to be rewarded for your faith. Even if you're not rewarded in this lifetime, Jesus Christ is going to reward you in your life for your faith. And your faith will be tested, it's telling you. You know, so you're like, well, you know, I, sometimes I doubt that God can do things. Well, congratulations, you're normal. Because your faith will be tested. It'll be, it's a trial, having faith. It's not something that's just easy to just believe 
that God can do these things and God can intervene for you in your life. But, you know, you're supposed to have stronger faith and stronger faith as you go through life. It's going to be tried. It's going to be tried through fire, the Bible says. So the first thing is you'll be rewarded for your faith, whether in this life or the next. The second one is you'll avoid a lot of trouble. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter number 5. You'll avoid a lot of trouble because, again, using the example that I just went through, 1 Timothy chapter 5, look at verse number 8. If you decide that you're not going to have faith in God and you're going to get outside the will of God and you're going to just fix things yourself, you're going to end up in a lot of trouble in your Christian life. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 5, verse number 8, it says, look at this. It says, but if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, look at this. It seems kind of an odd statement in that, I mean, it's literally say, saying like how bad you are if you won't work. If you're just like some lazy person that won't work, how bad it is. I mean, it says like it's, you're worse than an infidel. Like, it, you, I mean, there's, there's, and look, that's true. Because how many people do you know, and infidel just means unbeliever. Most unbelievers are out there working and providing for their families. He's like, you as a saved Christian, it's not saying you're, you're, you are an infidel. It's saying you as a saved Christian should not be worse than an infidel. I mean, this is just in general. Can I just make this statement? Like, as a Christian, you should be better than people that are not saved. As a Christian, you shouldn't just be this disgusting dirtbag. <laughs> as a Christian, you should be a decent person. Unsaved people shouldn't be able to look at you as a Christian and be like, that's disgusting. Or that, that's a bad person right there. Because you know what? You're worse than an infidel in that case, if that's you. Christians should be good what? <laughs> Examples? I mean, th this is like Christianity 101. Like, why does this even have to be preached? Christians should be good examples. But look at the, the, the part of the verse that I didn't read. Somebody that doesn't work, that just isn't doing what God told them to do, it's like, he hath denied the faith. You know what that means? You're not listening to what God says. You're not believing that if you go out there, and you're like, yeah, but it works hard. And the last couple of jobs that I've had, like, people were bad, and it was really difficult, and it just, like, it just wasn't enjoyable. It's not supposed to be enjoyable, first of all. What in the world? Like, oh, I think I need this perfect job where everyone just loves me and praises me every single day, and I get to, you know, you know be this person that does nothing and just is exalted. It doesn't exist. It's called work for a reason. But the Bible is saying that if you don't do that, I mean, literally in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse number 10, it says if you don't work, you shouldn't eat. That would solve a lot of problems today, wouldn't it? I mean, you wouldn't have many people not working today. If you wouldn't have people here not providing for their own families if they just got hungry as soon as they didn't work. But the Bible is saying it's a denial of faith to do that. And it's the same with, with anything else. And look, you think God's going to intervene in your life when that's you? When you're denying that basic thing, you're like, no, I'm not going to do what God says. He told me right here to do it. Fornication is the same way. Like, well, I want to get married and I want to find the, the person to get married. And you're just in fornication. You're just fornicating with whoever you want or whatever. And you're like, well, I, I hope that God, you know, you know, blesses me and I end up finding someone to marry. No, you're denying the faith. Why would he intervene for you? Why would he do that? Romans 12, 19 says, Dearly beloved, here's another one. Avenge not yourselves. How about this one? But rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Say something, somebody does something really bad. And you're like, I have to take vengeance in that case. You know what that is? That's a denial of the faith. That's a denial that God can handle things. That's a denial of what God is literally saying in the Bible. Like, no, I have, to have, I have to avenge myself. Denial of faith. And look, if you deny faith and you get outside of the Lord's will and you don't have any faith, so you don't see God intervening, you see how this is a snowball effect? You don't see God intervening in your life. Like, I need to take things into my own hands. I need to get outside the will of God. And it's worse for Christians because they know that they're outside the, the will of God. And the Bible says, you know, when he knows his Lord's will and prepared not himself, that's who's going to get beaten with many stripes. So 
If you know God's will, you just have to have faith that if you stay in that will, he'll take care of things. That's it. But you see how you can get into this snowball effect of not believing that God can help you, not believing that God can intervene. You're like, I just can't keep going to this nine to five where I'm making, you know, $18 an hour or whatever. This just isn't getting it done. I got to go out and I got to do this stuff over here. That's unjust. No, God is going to exit the intervention for you at that point. Look, I was this person, even after I got saved, I had not seen God like these, these big interventions in my life. And I was actually this kind of person that was, that was more of a belief like, yeah, God, you know, you kind of just got to do it yourself. And I would even kind of chuckle at people that would be like, well, you know, um, God really intervened for me there and God really did that. I would kind of chuckle at that because I'd never personally seen it myself until I took a huge leap of faith and then I saw God moving literal, I mean, not literal, but moving mountains in my life. Like, I just, we look back on it and we can't believe it happened kind of stuff. Where you're like, that definitely was God intervening. But the faith came first. Moving across the country without a job. Something that, like, I literally thought in my secular, fleshly mind that I was going insane at times. But that's when you see God move. That's when you see God intervene. So if you've never seen God intervene, it's probably a faith problem in your life. So if God's not moving, you don't think he's listening, you're praying, you don't think he's listening, the number one reason why is you probably have a lack of faith that he can do what you need him to do. Wait. Believe that he can do it. Be patient. Have some temperance. You see how these things work together? So I believe that this is one of the most important fruits of the Spirit. Now let's just close the series here. The fruits of the Spirit that we went through are these, in the, in the backwards order. We just, we just talked about faith. Last week we talked about gentleness. We talked about temperance, which is controlling yourself, which is having, you know, you know that's where the word a temper, that guy has a horrible temper, that's where that comes from. We talked about joy. We talked about peace. We talked about long-suffering. We talked about goodness. Let me read that list again. Faith, gentleness, temperance, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness. Now let me ask you a question. Is that you? Is that who you are? If I would ask your closest friend, your wife, your husband, would they say that those things describe who you are? And look, you should keep that list. You should keep that list with you, and you should focus on the ones that you are lacking in your life. You should find a place. You should find the place where you are giving into the flesh, because if you find one that you're lacking, you are giving into the flesh somewhere in your life. If you find one, I mean, just, and, and, and then you should fix it. You say, how do I fix it? You're like, I'm not a joyful person. Well, you know what you should do? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain this in detail tonight, but you should look at examples around you. You say, I'm not a joyful person. I'm depressed. I, I only talk about negative things. I can't find joy in my life. You know what you should do? You should find someone who is joyful. And you should, you should find out how they do it. You know what? You could ask how they do it. <laughs> you can have a friend that is joyful all the time and just ask them. There, and I guarantee you, if you find one of these fruits of the Spirit that you're struggling in, and you know somebody that's very good at that fruit of the Spirit, I guarantee you, 1,000%, they are doing something or not doing something that you are doing or not doing. They are literally just operating differently than you are. And then once you find out what that thing is, just remove that influence, whatever that is. Whether it be good that you need to add or bad that you need to remove. Maybe it's both. It's probably a little bit of both. But diagnose the problem, remove it, add it, whatever you need to do, fix it. Take action. Think about this one, long-suffering. Long-suffering. Long-suffering should be one that you should be able to fix immediately. Why? Because it's just an attitude. That's why. It's just a simple, it's just a simple perspective in your mind. Like, I'm somebody that's impatient with people. I just drop the hammer on people immediately. I'm super cynical. And look, 
I am much more long-suffering today than I was when I was 25. It's something you get better and better and better and better at in your life. But look, it's just an attitude. You can fix that immediately. It's not like you have to change something physically or anything like that. It's, look, what is causing me to not be long-suffering? What is causing me to be impatient with people? Find someone who is long-suffering, someone who's a good example, and compare and contrast. Again, get to the root cause. See, the world, the world will tell you on these fruits of the Spirit versus the works of the flesh, the world will tell you, and even many intellectuals and writers and people that I even follow and read on a regular basis, they will tell you that you are who you are. And studies and experiments and, and polling and all kinds of like actual scientific data will show this too. That by age whatever you have this, by age 8 you have this set, by age you know, 15 you have this set, by age 30 this is set. It is, for most people, it is true. That you are who you are. But let me ask you this. What percentage of people are saved? The experiments all make sense to me. 99% of people, 98% of people, say you're just this huge spiritual optimist and say 3% of people are saved on this planet. But that means 97% of people. The vast majority of people are who they are. They're set. They like the music they like. They do the things that they do. They're just going to, uh, you know, outside of some major interventions, their personalities, who they are, it's set. That's why all the data shows this. But notice what the sermon series was called. It was called the fruits of what? It wasn't the fruits of you. It was the fruits of the spirit that is in you. And the spirit is not in those 97% of people, but it is in you. So that rule that you are who you are, that does not apply to you at all. And again, Christians should have the ability to change. They should be better than the infidel in those cases. They should be able to look at the fruits of the Spirit and see where they're lacking and say, no, 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 I'm into these you know, works of the flesh here in these areas of my life, and I need to get these things. I mean, why would God say separate? Why would God say set standards? Why would God say do all these things in this book if there's no chance you could change? It's the fruits of the Spirit that is in you. That is God in you. As if you're more powerful than God. All you have to do is follow the Spirit. All you do is have to just, just let the Spirit lead in you. Deny that flesh, and these fruits will come out. Because the Spirit's in you. It's not in everybody else. So those researchers and all those people that, that study all this, and psychologists and all this, they're wrong, but only for that 3%, which is you, which was the point of this sermon. John 14, 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things. Well, he's going to teach me all this new stuff, but I guess I can't do anything about it. Give me a break. And bring all things to your remembrance. Even when you forget things and you get into the flesh, he's going to, you're going to tell that you're grieving the Spirit. There's always going to be that warning, that red flag, something's wrong here. More people need to listen to their conscience who are saved. And whatsoever I have said unto you, all you have to do is have the faith to let him, the Holy Spirit, help you. That's it. And then you'll start to see those fruits in your life. Let's bow our heads.